Good morning, Grace Church. Welcome, welcome. You guys doing all right today? Yeah, yeah. Well, I just want to welcome you to our Southern Pines campus, and I just want to welcome everyone watching online, and uh, Pastor Jimmy and the church out of Seven Lakes. Grace to you guys. Um, Pastor AJ here, executive pastor. Guys, there's a lot of exciting stuff happening at Grace Church. Uh, what you just saw uh, was a trailer for our upcoming sermon series called Running with the Horses. We'll be traveling through the book of Jeremiah. So we want to encourage you. This is going to be a phenomenal time as a church uh, that we're just walking through the Word of God together. Um, there are, uh, we have reading guides for you. If you want to start, get ahead. You know, you can start reading through the, the book of Jeremiah right now, but it's going to be a phenomenal time. We're really looking forward to it uh, as a church walking through this series. And then uh, and one other thing before we get into the Word today that Wendy mentioned, um, I'm really excited about this. Um, as you know, kind of our world is shifting very quickly, uh, especially with how people hold wealth. And we realize that a, a, lot of our, a lot of our people, and in fact, in a lot of churches, most people hold their wealth right now in non-cash assets like stocks, bonds, mutual funds, cryptocurrencies. And, you know, we as a church haven't really had an, an easy, effective, and really safe and secure way for you to give out of that pocket. But now we do. Uh, we've just partnered with a company called Overflow, uh, which makes it very easy on your end to be able to give out of that pocket. So if God's blessed you in that arena, it's a great way for you to give and we as a church can easily take receipt of those gifts. We can liquidate it. We can put it right to work for the kingdom of God. So uh, a great tool that I'm excited about. There's more information on our website, gracechurchsp.org slash give. And then uh, the other great thing about it is Uncle Sam keeps his hands out of, out of the whole pot, right? Because if you, you liquidate your own stuff, you have to pay what's called capital gains tax. Um, and so that's hefty sum. You know, if you give it to the church, not only do you not have to pay that on your taxes, we don't have to pay it either because we're a tax-exempt organization. So something I'm excited about, um, just wanted to share that with you. But uh, with that being said, you ready for the, the main session day, uh, get into the Word of God? You guys hungry for the scriptures this morning? I, I am, so I, I hope you came hungry because we're gonna eat today from the revelation. So uh, if you would, I believe it's important to give honor to God, and we can do so by standing for the reading of his words. So if you're physically able, uh, if you're physically able, just stand uh, for the reading of the scriptures. If you have your Bibles with you, you can go ahead and open them as well. We're going to be in the Revelation of Jesus Christ, chapter 21. We're going to be reading verses 9 through 11 today. If you don't have a Bible, I'll have the, the words on the screen behind me. I just want you to listen now to the very Word of God. This is what he spoke to his servant John. Verse 9. Then came one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues and spoke to me, saying, Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great high mountain and showed me the holy city Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, having the glory of God, its radiance like a most rare jewel, like a jasper, clear as crystal. Let's pray. Father, I, I thank you today, Father, that, um, God, that we have access to a revelation that you so graciously gave to your son, who he graciously gave to John, who John graciously gave to us the church to build up the church. God, I pray that hope would be, would be, in, would be built into people today. God, I just pray life and, and, and expectation and anticipation, Father, would rise amongst us today as we look forward to the inheritance, God, that you are preparing for those that love you. Father, as we look towards eternity today, Father, God, would our spirits, Father, be lifted up Father, would our minds be elevated, God, to see what you have prepared for us, Father. God, we thank you that, God, we have this book in our Bible. God, a book that was almost taken out of the scriptures. God, we thank you, God, that we have access to it today, God, and we pray that this would be a, a, an honor to you, God. You would be blessed in our worship, God. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen. You may have a seat. Thank you for standing. I want to um, just want to start start off today with a with a question, um, just kind of spur you on and start thinking about what we're going to be talking about today. Um, and that's this: Have you ever thought about um, at some point in life, um, or even recently, have you thought about what heaven will be like? 
Have you ever thought about what eternity is going to be like? What happens when our life is over on this plane of dirt that we're on currently? I don't know about you, but you know, I remember as a kid, this was something I thought about constantly as a child. You know, as I've noticed over the years, I've kind of picked up a trend that, that kids actually think a lot about eternity. You know, and they ask a lot of questions about heaven. And, you know, that's how I was as a kid. And one of the things I thought about all the time was heaven. The only problem is that as a kid, I, I didn't really get any really solid biblical teaching about what heaven would be like. And so, like most people, I kind of resorted to what the cartoons told me about heaven. And so, you know, maybe you've done that, done that as well. You have, have children that have kind of done that as well. And so, you know, my concept of heaven was basically what came through on, you know, Nickelodeon or the Cartoon Network, you know, and how they would conjure up heaven. And so, um, you know, this first one is a classic. Uh, this is one that the cartoons like to tell us about heaven, that heaven is uh, basically, if you go pull that one up behind me, that heaven is basically a place where we just have conversations, the same conversations we had here on earth, the same people we had them on earth with, except in heaven we do it floating on clouds with angels and, uh, and garments on, right? And, you know, here you got the old man and woman arguing about the same things they were talking about on earth. Or this, this second one, for some reason the cartoons always conjure up this picture that we have to climb some massive staircase to get up somewhere into the clouds where I guess heaven is, right? This idea that we're um, gonna have to practice our climbing skills here on earth. Or, or this, this third one, which, which I always joke about is funny for our uh, worship team, is that I guess when we get to heaven, there will be no shortage of musicians. Because apparently in heaven, everyone plays the harp. So, you know, if you've ever inspired, to, you know, aspired to be a harp player, just wait, just wait. According to the cartoons, you get to heaven and, you know, you, you'll just, man, you'll have it down pat, right? And, you know, these are, these are the images. You know, if you just go on Google or even turn on your favorite cartoon show, you're probably gonna see these images of heaven. And, you know, why they kind of make us giggle and laugh, what they do unconsciously is they be, begin to build in us an incorrect view of the kingdom of God. And guys, Satan loves to work in the seemingly unnoticeable ways, even through cartoons. And I, as a kid, thought that what heaven would be like. And to be honest, the more I thought about heaven like that, the more heaven, instead of inspiring me, it actually scared me. Rightfully so, right? Who wants to go to a place where all you do is float on clouds, play harps, and do meaningless things forever <laughs> with no end? That's the real scary part. That's what I thought about. I'm a child. I don't really know any different. And in that, my hope began to slip in the seemingly innocent things because our very hope, according to the apostles and the prophets and the writing of the scriptures, is the kingdom of God. That's the, that's the gospel Jesus taught, the gospel of the kingdom, the very thing that's being prepared for the saints, the very thing that the apostle Paul talks about, the redemption of our bodies. But we wouldn't wait for this in anticipation or expectation if that's what we think it is, right? It's like having a massive inheritance stored up for you, a trillion dollars from your great uncle, and it's got your name written on the inheritance, but your whole life you've been taught that he only put away a couple bucks. You change your view, your hope of what lies before you. And far too long we've been taught that our inheritance is nothing but floating away onto a distant cloud, but that's not what the scriptures teach. Oh my, they teach anything but that. And so this message comes from a personal place. As I'm bringing you right in to the place that I've been spending for really the last three years or so. About three years ago, I remember opening this book, The Revelation of Jesus Christ, and I remember reading a verse in the beginning, Revelation 1-3. I don't have it on the screen, but it says, blessed is he who reads aloud the words of this prophecy and does what is written in it. And I remember reading that, 
And I was just thinking, like, can that really be the case? Can I get a blessing from reading a book that most people my whole life have said, stay away from that book? It's got lions, tigers, and bears, and dragons, and fire, and hailstones, and a book that honestly was almost removed from the scriptures. But God said, through Jesus, through the angel, through John, to us, blessed is he who reads aloud the words of this prophecy. So I decided to take God at his word and say, all right, God, I'm gonna, I'm gonna spend time in this book, however long it takes. I'm not gonna put a timeline on it. Let's just see what happens. And I wanna testify to you today, three years from that point, that I've been more blessed in my Christian life in the last three years through studying this book than I have been since I became a Christian. The reason is because God is true to his word. When you take God at his word, he actually, he fulfills it because he's faithful to everything he said. But the reason I believe it's really sowed hope into me is because the revelation gives us insight into eternity. It gets us in a mindset of thinking about what lies ahead for the saints of God. We spend so much time, so much of our life, we're fixated on this life. Yet the scriptures teach that this life is but a mist that appears for a while and then it's poof, it's gone. So why would we not be spending more time looking at eternity? And I believe it is our meditation upon eternity that really begins to build our hope. And that's what I want for you today in a world where everything is designed to basically tear you down. I wanna put the hope of God inside of you today. That has been my prayer preparing for this message, that the same hope God's given me, he would extend that to you through his word. And so I trust he's gonna do that. But we have to start somewhere. And when we start talking about a topic as big as the kingdom of God, which by the way is the main theme of the entire Bible, please have grace, I cannot think of covering that in 30 minutes. So I'm going to try to just scratch the surface here. But when we start thinking about the kingdom of God, we must ask this first question, the most obvious one, which is what is heaven? What is heaven? Is heaven just this abstract, ethereal place that just exists out in the sky somewhere in a galaxy far, far away? Or is heaven, as some people like to teach, just a state of mind, just a state of being that you kind of go in and out of? What does God tell us heaven is? Well, if we go to the passage today, Revelation 21, starting in verse 9, a little bit of context shows us that we have an angel and we have John. And this angel, it's kind of like take John to work day. Right? The angel takes John with him and he's like, come on, John, I'm going to show you Literally, I'm gonna show you, like in a movie, what lies ahead, what heaven looks like. And the first statement we see from the angel about heaven in verse nine is he tells John, come, I will show you, so he's showing him, the bride, the wife of the lamb. The angel gives this picture that heaven is actually a personified woman this woman being the bride of our Lord Jesus Christ. In the next 11 verses, we actually see this bride in all of her beauty, all of the jewels that she's adorned with, her foundation stones made of sapphire, her streets made of gold. The prophets talked about this woman all throughout the scriptures the very woman that God is preparing for his son on that day. A wedding feast that believers in Jesus get to be guests of. A table that we get to sit at when he marries his bride. A beautiful day it will be, but this is the first picture we get of this heaven, that it is the bride, the wife of the lamb. And then the second verse of this passage in verse 10 we actually see the name of her. John says, and he carried me away into the, in the spirit to a great high mountain. So he, the angel takes John up on this massive mountain. I believe this mountain's reaching actually up into the firmament. And he showed me 
the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. John says the name of this bride, the name of heaven is the holy city, Jerusalem. Now this bride has many names throughout the Bible. Sometimes she's called the holy city, Jerusalem. Sometimes she's called paradise. Sometimes she's called the Garden of Eden. Sometimes she goes by names like the Lord is there, according to the vision Ezekiel got. Sometimes she goes by the name Beula, her land is married. Sometimes she goes by the name that I'm gonna refer to it as John did in verse two of Revelation 21, and that is the New Jerusalem. The New Jerusalem, which tells us very plainly that heaven, and if you're taking notes, you can write this down, that heaven is a city. The new Jerusalem, the holy city, Jerusalem, heaven is a city. And God actually is gonna solidify that through the next 11 verses by giving us the very dimension down, down to the inch of this city. So for all you type A's out there, you're gonna get the very specifics of what heaven actually is like. We get the schematics of it. The next thing we see about heaven, this bride, this city, is that John, say, John sees this city coming down out of heaven. He says the city's coming down. Now, which this tells us the city is currently up in the sky, up in heaven. Now, I don't want people to get confused here because we're talking about what is heaven and then John, sees, John says he sees it up in heaven. Now, the biblical word for heaven, when God created everything, it says he called the heaven the firmament. So when we start talking about what's above us, on day one, God created multiple heavens or firmaments, that's the Hebrew word rakia, it literally means a solid, beat out, dome-like structure that sits over top of us, multiple layers. And we know this is affirmed by the scriptures because in 1 Corinthians, Paul, either him or somebody he knew, he said, actually had a vision, like John, where they went up and they saw the city in the third heaven. And this trips up a lot of people because they say, well, I, well, I thought there was just one heaven. There's actually multiple layers of firmament above us. Paul sees this in the third layer, that the city is actually above, which would make sense because in Genesis 1 through 3, we actually see the story of when Adam and Eve were booted out of the city. The very city that they were supposed to live in forever called the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve were booted out after they sinned. As God said, lest they should eat of the tree of life and live forever, God stations flaming, sword-bearing cherubim at the edge of the garden. And I believe, according to Isaiah, that that is the garden that right now is up in the third firmament layer, that we are waiting for its return. And who's gonna bring it back? Guess who? Jesus. This is his bride, being prepared, being beautified, being adorned by his father. What's also interesting, and this also blows up a lot of common myths about heaven, that this, it's this mysterious far off place. John tells us that he sees heaven, this new city, the new city, the new Jerusalem. He says it comes down out of heaven to the earth. It comes here. We don't go off somewhere else. The city actually comes here, which might throw a wrench in your whole thought about heaven because I thought about this, well, why the heck? Why is it coming here? This place is jacked up. Here's what we need to understand. Contextually, this earth will be made new, the scriptures say. It will be renewed, kainos in the Greek. It literally means it will be cleansed. Same place, but cleansed. And this makes sense, right? Because when Jesus returns, when he comes, he actually cleanses the earth. He destroys all the enemies. There's actually massive earthquakes that will happen at the end of the age. When he comes, 
The earth will be shaken to such a degree that the prophets say the mountain shall be made low and the valley shall be raised up. So what the earth will, ha will be like will be a flattened plain, literally a broad plain. And when the city comes down, this is a beautiful thing, every single inhabitant on the earth will be able to see the city. The prophets say, by its light, the nations will walk and the kings will bring their glory into it. In fact, at the end of the thousand year reign of Jesus on earth, it says the, the, the armies that are deceived by the devil, they come marching over the flattened plain of the earth because they can see it from far away. Before they even get to the gates of the city, fire comes down out of heaven and destroys all of them. But this is what we see the scriptures teach us about the idea of heaven is that heaven actually comes to earth. And so when we read the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus' teachings in Matthew 5 through 7, where he's teaching about the kingdom of God, this is why when he was teaching us about kingdom behavior, he said, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Why would I want to inherit the earth? Well, Jesus maybe knew something about the kingdom that we don't, that the kingdom comes to the earth. When he taught his disciples how to pray, what did he say? Pray like this, your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Right? That's what John, John is literally seeing this prophetically into the future, way beyond our time right now. He's seeing that the kingdom actually come to the earth. Now, when the kingdom sets down, the new Jerusalem, the holy city, the bride of the lamb, we get its, we get its dimensions here that, that John talks about. And these dimensions, I think, will blow your mind. Let me just show you. Verse 16, verse 16 tells us, Revelation 9, verse, I'm sorry, 21, verse 16 says, the city lies four square, its length the same as its width, and he measured the city with his rod, 12,000 stadia. Its length and width and height are equal. Now, just to give you an idea of what shape this is, length, width, and height all being equal means it's a cube, which, okay, that's, that, that's fair. It's a symmetrical shape, um, but I want you to see what John says the measurement is. 12,000 stadia? Now, if you, have a, if you have a study Bible, maybe if you don't even have a study Bible, you'll, pro you'll probably see a footnote there next to stadia. Your, my, my Bible says about 1,380 miles. A stadia is about 670 feet if you use that measurement. So just to give you an idea, this city, based on the measurement you use for stadia, is anywhere from 1,380 miles to 1,500 miles, somewhere in there, long, wide, and high. Guys, that's, just to put in perspective, Mount Everest is five and a half miles tall. It's the tallest mountain in the world. If you climb Mount Everest, like, man, you're doing something. The top of the New Jerusalem, where the throne of God and the sun are, is 1,500 miles from the foundation of the earth. Think about that for a minute. Like, ain't nobody hoofing it up that mountain. <laughs> nobody. That's why Paul says flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom. That's why it says we have to be born again of spirit and water because only a resurrected spirit body is gonna be able to ascend the hill of the Lord. These, these are things we see in the scriptures and just to give you a visual of this, I, and I want you to be careful because it's very hard. I, I, I did not find an artist rendering that I believe truly captured everything that the scripture teaches about the New Jerusalem, but this one um, gives you a bit of an idea of what that city will look like as it descends. If you could bring up that picture of the, uh, it looks like the golden bl glistening cube um, behind me. So there you go. That's if, if we're looking at what John's seeing, he's seeing something of that effect, right? And we can see there's three gates on each side of the city. But again, the dimensions are much, much larger. I mean, to scale that, you're probably talking about, you know, one inch of that diagram is equal to, you know, 100 miles or something. So, right, absolutely incredible structure that's coming down to the earth. 
Now, who has access to the kingdom of God? I think this is a very important question because it's, it's something that Jesus taught on consistently. And he gave parable after parable after parable about how to enter the kingdom of God. Right? This entering the kingdom is a very important concept in the Bible. So how do we enter the kingdom? Well, I want you to think about the New Jerusalem as a kingdom. Right? It operates like a kingdom. So just think about, right, let's just use the United States for an example. You could call the United States, it's, it's a kingdom in a sense. It's a nation. Now, the kingdom of God has a king. It's a theocracy, so it's not, not a monarchy. It's a, they have a king. The king is God and the son, Jesus, right? We operate in republics a little bit different, but they're similar concepts. For example, only citizens can enter into any kingdom, right? So if you're not a citizen of the United States and you try to come in the borders, you're going to get stopped by border security, and they're going so to ask you, show me your citizenship, Well, that's, that's probably not the best example anymore right now, but, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I'm thinking about that. I'm like, well, uh, did, did, you, you, get the, you get the point, though, right? In a, in, a, in, a, in a kingdom that's operating correctly, there are citizens and there are non-citizens. The same is true with the kingdom of God. So when we approach the gate of the kingdom of God, right, guess who's getting in? Citizens. Non-citizens are outside outside of the kingdom. Every citizen of the kingdom of God, just like America, is registered in a registry of citizens in a database. The register of citizens for the kingdom of God is located in heaven right now. It's called the Lamb's Book of Life. Every person that has access to the city is registered in that book. Only those people can go in and out of the city. If a name is not in the Lamb's Book of Life, they do not have access to this inheritance. And I'm gonna talk about in a little bit how do we gain citizenship in the kingdom of God because it's the very thing that we wait for as saints. But let's say we are a kingdom and we go into the city. What is life like in heaven? You know, very practical things that the Bible tells us even down to what we eat or drink in heaven. We actually have access to the very tree of life that was in the Garden of Eden because remember, the new Jerusalem heaven is the restored Garden of Eden. The tree of life, this tree that has eternal life, we have access to eat from as a kingdom citizen. And it has variety. It says there's a different fruit each month, which is great. You don't have to eat the same fruit every single month. In fact, the tree, the tree has leaves for the healing of the nations. So during the thousand year reign of Christ, actually nations will not only come to the New Jerusalem to worship, they will actually come for health care because the New Jerusalem will have perfect health care available through the tree of life and its leaves. In the river of life, there's a water source in the New Jerusalem, a water source that actually flows from the throne of God. Ezekiel has a vision of this, and he said, I saw the water issuing from the threshold, and it flowed through the city. The tree of life was fertilized by this water, and then it kept flowing down into the Dead Sea, and it gave life to every type of fish. Now, when we talk about what people are doing in the New Jerusalem or in heaven, there's, there's many different occupations, and this one's gonna get a lot of my brothers excited. There's actually fishermen in heaven. If you like fishing now, guess what? You're gonna be able to fish in heaven. Yeah, Kyle. It says in Ezekiel 47 that the fishermen will be going crazy because the river of life, when it flows into the Dead Sea, all the fish, I mean, here, it's gonna be like shooting fish in a barrel. It's gonna be so easy to catch fish. And they're gonna be like, man, this is awesome, right? There are gonna be governors in the New Jerusalem. So for all of us that have been faithful in this life, Jesus says, I will set you over many cities. Five, 10, Luke 19 tells us this. These are just references. I, I don't have time to go through all these. Some of us will be farmers. For those of you who like to get your hands in the dirt and work the ground, we'll be planting vineyards in the New Jerusalem, Isaiah 65 says. Some of you construction workers out there, builders, will build homes in the New Jerusalem, also in Isaiah 65. Some of us will be teachers. This is a 
beautiful picture. Isaiah prophesies this in chapter two of his vision that the word of the Lord will go out from the new Jerusalem and it will be taught by the citizens. Now, it won't be like what I'm doing with you here, like where I've got to look up the scripture and I've got to you know, make notes because in the New Jerusalem, every citizen actually has the law inscribed on our very heart. So I don't have to, and any other citizen won't have to try to think, wait, what's that? What was that verse? It, it's encoded on us. It's literally in our DNA. Not only do we know it, but we perfectly obey it. That's actually the promise fulfilled of the new covenant that we're gonna look at in a minute. So we've got teachers, some will be pastors. I think Pastor Jimmy might be a pastor in the New Jerusalem, Jeremiah 3 says, I will give you those men who will feed you with knowledge and understanding, says the Lord. Man, there, Lord, give me more time. Mm, give me more time, Lord. Um, now, when we look at life in the city. Um, well, there's all these different aspects of what we'll be doing. Uh, we'll be putting our hands to work. Um, we'll be celebrating different holidays in the New Jerusalem. Um, we will be um, eating and drinking together. It is also the time at which all the prophecies are fulfilled where God actually says, I will dwell with them and they will be my people and I will be their God. So, I want to talk about the culmination of what heaven will be like, and that is worship. What will worship be like in heaven? Worship is the very thing that God designed us for. It's the very thing that God created Adam and Eve to do, is to worship him. It's the very thing that God ransomed the Israelites out of Egypt because he said, so that they could come worship me on this mountain. Worship is what we were created for. And worship will be the very thing, the very centerpiece of our life with God in the new Jerusalem. In the city, we have a design, just like God designed the tabernacle and the temples of old, with him seated at the top. In the new Jerusalem, we will ascend the hill of the Lord because we will have clean hands and a pure heart. And we will ascend God's holy mountain to worship him on a regular basis. Now, sometimes this is where we get a roadblock when we start thinking about worship in heaven. Because I know as when I was a kid, I thought that heaven, when it com comes to worship, that heaven was just going to be like a never-ending church service. Because, right, that's what we think about when we talk about worship. We, we, we think about corporate worship and singing and preaching. And, and I'll be honest with you, as a pastor, if heaven was a never-ending church service, I, would not, I wouldn't want to go there. A church, like a church service, like we're having here on earth, I, no. Now the, the problem is, when we think about heaven, when we think about life in the new Jerusalem, we oftentimes separate it from the resurrection. In this life right now, every time we come in to worship God, we have to come against forces that want to stop us, right? Pastor Ryan talked about this in the last series, right? There are Forces on the outside, right? They're demonic forces that come against us. Then there are forces within us. The Bible would call our flesh. Our flesh in this life wants to stop us from doing anything that would draw us closer to God. Whether that be having sinful impulses or thoughts or desires. So every time we come to worship God, we have to come against the very thing that wants to stop us. And Paul fought this battle. The apostle said, I fight it every day. My flesh wants to do the things I don't want to do. My spirit wants to do the things that are right. And it's a constant battle, but not so in heaven. Because in heaven, we will be resurrected 
in a new perfected body in which we will have the law of God written upon our hearts, which means that we will obey God perfectly. It also means when that covenant is fulfilled, our natural inclination will be to worship God. Our natural desire, which is not in this life, but in the next, as a resurrected, perfected saint, will be to worship him and be with him. We won't have to fight against the flesh anymore. I'm so sick of battling and battling and battling against the flesh. And if you're a saint, you don't have to be ashamed to say, man, it's tough, it's tiring, everything's coming at me, but not at the resurrection. That's our hope. And that's the very thing that when Jesus went to the cross, he sealed the promise. Hebrews says he inaugurated this covenant. Guys, not even Adam and Eve have access, had access to this covenant. We know that because they sinned. If they were in the new covenant, which the scriptures call the best covenant, the everlasting covenant, the covenant of peace, Isaiah calls it, Hebrews calls it the better covenant. If Adam and Eve were in that, they would have never sinned. They wouldn't have even been able to be deceived. Folks, we have access to the greatest covenant that has ever existed through Jesus' blood that was shed on Calvary. So when he held the cup up that night, and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. What Jesus was saying is my sacrifice is gonna allow you to enter into this covenant. And when you enter in and I resurrect you, I'm gonna put my spirit within you. I'm gonna cause you to walk in my statutes and everyone is gonna know God. Imagine a place where everyone knows God, where nobody sins. Folks, where there is no sin, guess what? There is no death. Because the wages of sin is death. The payout of sin is death. And guess what? When there's no death, there's no more pain. There's no more brokenness. There's no more crutches. There's no more struggling against this body. And our spirits are perfected. And so all the saints that have died throughout history, we are all awaiting this moment. And so when we separate the resurrection from the kingdom of God, it begins to utter, usher in confusion that leads to loss of hope. But the apostles and the prophets never, never divided these two, neither did the Christ. He married them together, and this is our hope. This is the hope for kingdom citizens. And I want you to have this hope. I want you to access the new covenant that Jesus purchased by his sacrificial death on the cross and his resurrection. And he's already in this life before us, guys. He's already there. He's already been raised into his perfected body. He's the firstborn of the dead, and we will be the nextborn of the dead following in suit. But you can enter into this today. If you came here today and you're like, I... I don't know if I'm in the Lamb's Book of Life. I don't know if I'm a citizen of God's kingdom. God has brought you here to make a decision, to know that, man, I'm, a king, I'm in the kingdom. And it, guys, it's simple, and Jesus taught us this. There's one entry point to the kingdom, and it's through what's called repentance. That's why Jesus said, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is here. What that simply means is we turn from a lifestyle of building our kingdom with us as king, making our own plans, doing life our own way with no thought of God to saying, you know what, I'm gonna stop that. I'm gonna stop just indulging what I wanna do, giving into sin, giving into sinful desire, and I'm gonna actually turn and embrace the kingdom of God. I'm gonna pledge allegiance to Jesus as king, and I'm gonna start building his kingdom. I'm gonna turn from sin and I'm gonna grab a hold of the Lord Jesus Christ. And at that moment, you then receive the Spirit of God to empower you in obeying him, and he walks with you. Guys, God is faithful. He's even faithful to you right now, even if you've been running from him. Even if you've been turning from him, he's still faithful, and he's still reaching out to you today. And he says, child, turn. Repent from that way of life and embrace me and trust me, and I will give you eternal life, everlasting life. You will be resurrected. 
in a perfected spirit body to dwell in the new Jerusalem and have access to the city.